the, the idea for this panel that, that Craig and I hatched a few years back was um, was on the Thursday, thinking on the Thursday evening before Western States, as folks are coming into town and and, uh, and kind of getting off, getting their nerves going and getting ready for the race, that uh, having a little event, uh, gathering together some experienced Western States veterans to talk about what it's like to run this race would be a, a cool idea, particularly for those people who might be here at Western States for the first time. So this is the time where we see who here is here at Western States for the first time. Well, welcome to Squaw Valley. Welcome, everybody. Uh, and over over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we will we will uh, hopefully impart some some wisdom and, and some ideas or some advice or at least some some silliness for uh, for all of you to uh, take away uh, later this evening and tomorrow. We'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end, but I also want to remind everybody that approximately 6.30, Diane Van Deeren. Diane, are you here? Uh, Diane Van Deeren is going to be uh, putting on a name. There's Diane back there. We say hello, Diane. Uh, starting at 6.30, she's here and uh, encourages many of you who, who can to, to stick around for that. Should be, she's an inspirational and extremely thoughtful speaker. It should be uh, quite, a, quite a nice evening. I have to say, with all due respect to the panelists who joined us over the last two years, uh, Gary Wang, Craig Thornley, Rory Fozio, John Trent, this year we have the panel to end all panels. This is an all-star panel, for sure. I indeed am humbled to be uh, up here on the stage with these folks. So without any further delay, what I'd, what I'd like each panelist to start with it will go from, from this side over here, past the mic, who they are, how many times they finished the race, of those finishes, how many times they won the race. And then I, we, they're all winners up here. Everybody's a winner here, <laughs> at least here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I've, I've asked them to come up with one thing, one thing that they wish they knew about this race before they ran it for the first time. All right, we'll start with you, Gordon. Hey, it works. Well, I'm Gordy Ainsley. I've won this race once against really severe competition. <laughs> <laughs> 200 horses. <laughs> and what I would, you know, what I would do over again, really different if I had to do over again, you know, that first run in 1974, is I would not race the horses for the first 15 miles. <laughs> <laughs> now, you won't have horses out there, but, you know, we all, we all go up hills at different paces, and you're gonna find that, you know, you're gonna wanna speed up because people are going by you, and, you know, maybe on a downhill you're going to want to speed up. Well, anyway, I wish I'd run my own pace that first 15 miles. And so, you know, if I had it to do over again, I would never let any of my muscles go into oxygen debt. I would never let any of my muscles burn all the way out of Squaw Valley, all the way to Lion Ridge, all the way to Red Star Ridge. And then, of course, from there it's downhill. <laughs> Thank you, Gordy. Gordy, hang on. How many finishes? You've you won once, but how many times have you finished this? I've finished. I've finished 23, and I've not finished four. And, and all of the not finishes have been, you know, well, three out of four of the not finishes have been since I turned 60. <laughs> John Rhodes and I talk about how. You know, it's like we turned 60 and we thought, well, that was easy. And then, you know, within a few months, it was like a wall fell on us. <laughs> so watch out for that birthday. All right. Thank you, Gordon. Jim! My name is Tim Tweetmeyer, and I've finished the race 25 times, and I've won the race five times. If there was one thing that, uh, that I've learned around this phase that I didn't know when I started is how crucial it is to take advantage and let the aid station people help you and your crew. 
And they're like little, like plugging yourself into the wall each time you get, especially at the end of the race. And there's really great experienced ultra runners and people there to help you. So uh, that's what you kind of rely on at the end when you start running out of steam is uh, letting someone else kind of kick you in the butt and get you down there. But the aid stations and the people helping you out there are phenomenal, so take advantage of it. Uh, I'm Ellie Greenwood. Um, I've run this race twice, my 200 milers ever. Somehow I won it twice. And uh, I think I'd basically say I probably intended to do it once. So all of you that have said I'm going to do one 100 miler ever, I wish I'd known at the start you can't do Western States just once. So uh, I'm sure you'll be putting your name back in the lottery again because uh, it's the best place to be at the end of June every year. what I'd do differently, sorry, Gordy. Um, I don't know, that's a hard one. Um, I would say, similar to Gordy, run your own race. Um, the first year I came, maybe a little, I don't know, confident, I don't know, that's quite the right word, but I hope to race from the start, and um, as some people might have heard, so, sorry, I'm afraid I'm kilometers, but 100K into the 160K race, I'm sixth place. 30 minutes back, vomiting, because, well, I was trying to race from the get-go. So, uh, enjoy those early miles, um, and certainly last year I had, I guess, a little more confidence uh, to do your own thing, not think about other people, um, and overall, you have a much more enjoyable race that way, um, and ultimately more successful as well. I didn't finish the first two times I did the race, and then um, I uh, finished 14 times after that. Um, I think uh, what um, I learned, it took me two times, those first two times, to learn to respect the heat, and um, take it a little easier. It's okay to take it a little easier with the conditions, instead of having a pre-race plan of what you want and think you can do. Um, let the conditions sort of dictate the day. And uh, once I that got that little dial, then it got a little easier. So thank you. How many times did you win? Um, 14. 14. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off script for a second here before we go into the uh, before we go into the, the, the questions. Thank you for those introductions. Um, you know, for those of us like myself who came of age in, in ultra running in the 1990s, uh, the name Anne Trayson uh, conjures up images of, of grit and toughness and fortitude that I think are truly remarkable. And uh, I think everybody in here knows Anne's been. Been, a, been away from the race for a few years, and I want to say on behalf of everybody here, everybody a part of the Western States uh, organization, and especially all the runners, and it is so great to have you back here in Scotland. minds going into Saturday. Some years it hasn't been as prevalent as others, but this year it's on our minds, and that's the heat. Uh, all four of these runners in different ways have had to put up with their version of hot Western states. Uh, but I thought we'd start with the heat question with Gordy. Uh, Gordy's been dealing with the heat here the longest. And, uh, and had some incredible experiences as far back in the mid-70s with the heat. So, Gordy, what I'd like you to talk a little bit about is how you 
deal with the heat here in Western states. Um, what are some tricks or, or, or even mind games you might be able to play? And perhaps most importantly, the third piece, what should runners be careful of, both in dealing with the heat and in potentially addressing issues around heat? Well, my, my first run in 1974 was the hottest run I've ever done. The temperature was 107, and that was the second hottest. Andy Gonzalez, three years later, got 108. And uh, the way we dealt with it was we didn't wear a hat, we didn't carry water, <laughs> and he didn't even wear a shirt. <laughs> and that's how we dealt with it. There are better ways of going about this. <laughs> My suggestion is, I did one thing right, I wore a white shirt. So, if you were planning to wear something other than a white shirt tomorrow, I urge you to change your dress. Wear white. If you can wear a white cap, that's good too. I don't own one for some reason. You may not either. The cap's not quite so big a deal because you know you can put ice under it and you know you won't feel the fact that the sun's absorbing into it. But there's you know there's some strategies in in, in dealing with heat. Um, you know you can say on one hand make good time while, you, while it's cool, and that's valid, but then on the other hand, you want to enter the hot part of the day well hydrated. And the two don't, you know, they're ob obviously opposite to each other, so you have to find the balance that's best for yourself. And so, you know, what I would say is, don't ever be in a hurry. I, people ask me how to run this race, and I say, go as fast as you can while feeling like you're loafing a little. And that, that'd be my advice to you as far as the heat. And, you know, get something wide and, and make sure you have enough fluid. And also, I would say if you're running out of fluid and there's a creek, just remember you won't get Giardia until next week at least. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you know, it's just vomiting and diarrhea. You know? It's not that bad. There's a good drug for it, you know. And after you've had it once, you've got a little more immunity. It's a good thing. <laughs> Alright, this is good, Gary. There you go. Alright, so uh, there's, there's medicine for that. Thanks, Gary. Tim, Tim, in your, in your 25 finishes, uh, you, you were legendary in, um, in your ability to take care of yourself. I have one memory of your 25th finish in 2006, interestingly enough, when high temperature in that, on that day, I believe in Auburn, was 105, 100, or, or thereabouts, maybe a little bit lower. Um, and I sat next to you when we were doing the medical check, and my CPK was in the mid five figures, and I think yours was in the low four figures, and probably had been that way for 25 years. Um, what, are, what are a few tidbits of information that you could pass on from your 25 years experience for that self-care out there? What's the secret for taking care of yourself on the Western States course? Like I say, in particular on those super hot days, you know, 95, 93, uh, 2006 was pretty, pretty awful. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I usually took an extra white shirt, like Gordy said, you know, I had a shirt that I could get off really easy, just tear off, dunk in a creek, dunk in a river, dunk wherever I needed to dunk and put it right back on. So I had like a singlet or a sleeveless, and then I had like a, an overshirt that I could just quickly pull off, dunk in a creek, and put right back on. No matter how cool it is when you dunk it, you know, five minutes later it's probably dry and you're sweating again, but it, it's, the temperature's gonna be over 100, you know, that's the only way you're gonna be able to cool off. The other one in particular, maybe, maybe Ann has some tips on this, because her and I were running, you know, almost stride for stride in 95, when it was 107 now, was, we, I, I got to the point where I was only running, you know, maybe 10 minutes at a time and I'd stop and walk. I never wanted to get to the point where I was really sweating profusely during the day because it would be really hard to catch up or stay hydrated enough. So I'd run on the shady stuff and I'd run when uh, it was cooler and then when it got really hot I'd just run and walk and run and walk to the point where I was never really, you know, leaning over and had sweat dripping off my nose. But. Uh, you know, that's, that's, I was doing some calculations between the hot years and what the guys ran last year and the women ran last year, and there's a good three hour swing between the leaders on a hot year and the leaders last year. So it's not a 10 minute adjustment, a 20 minute adjustment, it's a hours of adjustment when you have this kind of heat. So, you know, take care of yourself. Thank you, Tim.
so I, so I joked a little bit, of course, with Ali, just maybe a setup this morning when we were chatting and having her on the, veter her, her on the veterans panel with her, her two races and her two wins and her course record and all that. But, uh, you know, Ellie is a veteran of fighting through, of persevering. And uh, as, as I've observed you as an ultra runner, both in Western states and also in, in ultras around the country, you seem to be uh, blessed with a, with a particular skill of kind of getting through the rough spots. I've seen you in some rough places, even with that glowing smile. It's not always so glowing. Uh, what, how do you get through those rough spots? We're all gonna have them. We're all gonna have them on Saturday. Some tips on getting through those rough spots that you seem to do so well. Um, well, hopefully everyone that's racing on Saturday has done a reasonable amount of training. Um, and all that training, I would say I absolutely adore running, but there are points during that training where you think I'd rather be doing something else, or this is getting tough, and why am I doing this? Saturday is what you've been working towards, and so if you're in a really low point, um, I basically say, and this might not agree with this, but if you drop out halfway, all that training's kind of gone to waste. Yes, you've enjoyed it in your training, and you've achieved something, even if you only get part way, but ultimately you were doing that training to reach the finish line. So if you're going through a tough spot, do you know what? Even if you're right at the back of the pack and you're halfway through 15 more hours and then you can stop. So you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, I'm sure you won't believe me because everyone said to me like, oh, you can work through rough spots. I had in the first year that I ran Western States some very rough spots and I say, then put all your goals out the window. I'd gone into that race hoping that I could be up in contention with winning, and I said, I don't care if I run 29.59 and I get a bronze belt buckle, I'm getting a belt buckle. And this was going from, you know, maybe, I don't know, two, three hours before thinking, hey, can I win this thing? I then totally relaxed, because if you're putting too much pressure on yourself, um, then that's when it can all backfire. So truly believe that you can work through really rough spots. You've worked through rough spots already. You've just got to do a little bit more. Think of that finish line, but also think of, and again, I did this on the first year that I ran it, I would leave one aid station. I'd say, where's the next aid station? And this seemed like really, really ridiculous. So if you're, they were saying, well, it's, I don't know, six miles away, and we're all ultra runners trying to run 100 miles. But if you can make it six miles, and then you can make it the next five miles. Um, so really do break it down and uh, just try and relax, look up, enjoy the scenery. If there's runners around you, use the energy off them and uh, you can work through the rough spots. All right, thanks, Ellie. And, and in, in your, over the years, observing your racing, racing here and, and elsewhere, you, you had this, this ability no doubt to, to get into this this place, this zone, this single-minded uh, pain cave, if you will, and, and fight through. But uh, as you know, on, on hot days in particular, and I, I don't think you were immune to this, occasionally the tummy goes a little sour. <laughs> and uh, and you, were, you were somewhat legendary for, for figuring out a way through those stomach issues. I guarantee you, a uh, handful of, not more of the folks in this room are going to have some, some tummy problems on Saturday. How did you do it? I, um, I learned and, uh, that uh, it's not the end. When the, one of the two times I didn't finish was due that I freaked out. I had to green gate and I was throwing up and I'd never seen that much I didn't think I could throw up that much volume, okay? It's really it's me. And I just panicked. And I got to Highway 49. I'm like, I've been throwing up for all this. I'm going to die, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, IV, you're out of there. And you, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it's a little uncomfortable. It's challenging. But unfortunately, sometimes it happens. And it's not something that will stay with you. I've learned through the years. How not to have, I mean, my stomach would always be a little queasy, I have a little sensitive stomach. But uh, little tricks, chewing on ice, slowing down, I like the bandana around my head, around my neck. Uh, ice bucket, 
So um, just kind of learn tricks with not panicking and thinking it's the end of the world. And sometimes it's really disgusting, I admit. Throwing up, it just feels like the greatest thing in the world. And then you feel better and you keep going. So, uh, and try to enjoy it. I mean, even now after that, <laughs> you know, we're all talking like, if you listen to us, I'm taking back and like, like, why did I do it 14 times? It sounds like this awful experience. And it's like the greatest love of my life in this Western state. So have fun out there. No matter what happens, it's a great experience of great people. All right, thank you, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you've done it enough times, it's just like any other bodily function, really. <laughs> Trust me on that one. Um, let's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up. One of you pick, I'm going to throw some questions out there. Just grab the microphone if you want to take this. But a quick show of hands. Who in the crowd here is a pacer or a crew this, uh, this weekend? All right, excellent. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. We're, we're counting on you, and before we get to this question, take care of yourselves on Saturday, pacers and crews. You might be picking up your runner at Forest Hill, as far as late as Green Gate. It's a long, hot day. You don't want to go into your section dehydrated. You don't want the pacers throwing up, okay? <laughs> you can eat the aid station stuff, but we don't want you throwing up. Um, but uh, panelists, advice. For pacers, crews, runners, it's an interesting relationship, that pacer-crew-runner thing. Um, what might you, what, what wisdom might you share with the, with the pacers and crews out here for uh, working with their runners as they make it through the day on Saturday? <laughs> I have awesome crew, four of them are here even though uh, I'm not running on Saturday. <laughs> They're unemployed and they're not for hire. <laughs> um, I think ask your runners beforehand, um, particularly I think with the heat and the fact that people are getting slowed down. What I always said to my uh, pacers and crew is I want to get to the finish line regardless of time or position. And because your runner part way through might be saying, that's it, I've had enough, there's absolutely no way, no, sorry I'm out, don't want it, whatever. But if you know when they were in a lucid state that they were saying, no, the most important thing ever is I get to the finish line, it's important um, that you know that. Um, also, don't take it personally, what your uh, runner might be uh, saying at you, not saying at you. Um, yeah, just gauge your runner. Um, there's times uh, that they might want to talk, or they might want you to talk, or if they say shut up, then you know, you want quiet crew. Um, and then pacers as well, like one of the great things I find is um, they take away like some of the mental aspects, like they'll be saying to me, like I like to know, and some runners might not, and this is when you need to find out, like when an aid station is coming up, and my pacers are briefing me before I get to the aid station, like, okay, what are you going to be taking from the aid station, are you going to have something to eat here, right, we've got this. Um, some runners might know the course inside out, some runners might not know it, might not want to know, whereas I say like to know if, okay, there's a big climb coming up, or, you know, um, maybe you've got a flatter section, so you can prepare them a little bit in advance. So I think just finding out in advance, like whether it's this evening or tomorrow, like does your runner like information and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, don't take it personally what they uh, are at you when they're out on the course. So you're helping them all the same. I just say some advice for the pacers is that uh, your job kind of out there is the thing for your runner. So there's especially the 30 hour guys who are going to be out there a day and a half. And you get really loopy out there as a runner. Your job as a pacer is just make sure they keep moving to the finish line and don't work, you know, ask them what they need in an aid station, ask them what they're going to need to take out of the next aid station because they'll forget. It's, it just happens to you. You get so tired that you'll think to say something and then by the time you go to say it, you'll forget what you're going to tell your pacer. Because <laughs> as a runner, you're just thinking, I need to get to the finish line. So pacers out there, you know, you need to, you know, work with your runner on that so you don't leave an aid station uh, without what you need. You know, as a pacer, it's, it's kind of hard. you got to know your runner a little bit because there's, there's times where the runner's going to want to, like, sit down on the trail and cry like a big bump. <laughs> and, you know, you might want to sit down with them, put your arm around and say, okay, everything's going to be okay. 
Or you might just go, hey, shut up and let's get running. So you, there's got to be a sense there between I need to help this person out or a little tough love and get my kick in the ass. So knowing your runner is important out there, but take care of them out there because they're, they're going to have a hard time just doing more than just moving forward. Anybody else on the Curtis and Pacers? Or anyone in the Well, I, I think I think the, the people who came before me for giving me such good tips. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking about a time when I should have been able to finish it, and I didn't. And I came into No Hands Bridge with an hour and ten minutes to go. And it took me two hours and ten minutes to get to the finish. And that was because I had uh, asked for a beer at Highway 49, and they refused me. <laughs> and that was a shock to me. And I got angry. And so I downed this big thing of Coke and took off in a huff. Instead of doing the reasonable thing, which would have been, you know, take in more than the amount of calories that would have been in that beer. And of course, when I got down to No Hands Bridge, I was so deeply into hypoglycemia that I wasn't even hungry. I wasn't very conscious. I couldn't think, I, you know. So I think probably the, the moral of the story is when your runner asks for something and you don't have it, make sure they get at least that number of calories in them. <laughs> You know, even if you have to, like, shake, grab them by the shirt and shake them, say, you have to eat that number of calories. Uh, you know, I think probably if I grab some watermelon, you know. The other thing is, when someone asks for, you know, a beer or something, let's say, <laughs> and, and, you, and you don't have it. By the way, I don't recommend... <laughs> I don't recommend you drink beer before Highway 49. <laughs> Get within seven miles of the finish. Um, I started at 10 miles of the finish. That was a mistake. But I still would have made it, you know, if I'd just taken enough calories. I had a lot of time. So anyway, the, the point being that if, if, you're, if your runner asks you for something and you don't have it, if you're a, a crew person, See if you can beg, borrow, steal, or buy it somewhere or from somebody so that they can have what they want the next time you see them. Like, you know, if I had presence of mind or my wife had, had presence of mind, she could have gone up to cool, bought some beer, and met me in no man's face. <laughs> but she didn't think, and I didn't think. And so I was down there, and if I got down to No Hands Bridge and asked for two cans of Pepsi or Coke or whatever, I would have made it to the finish, but I, I couldn't think. I would, see, when you're running and you're hot, I mean, this is a scientific fact. This is why swimmers don't get lean, is because they don't overheat. When you overheat during exercise, it suppresses appetite. You won't feel hungry. Remember that. You won't feel hungry. You even won't feel thirsty when you're dehydrated. The first sign of dehydration is when you get symmetrical, Soreness, that is, you know, lactic acid buildup symmetrically, not in, not in your left calf, but in both calves. That's the first sign of dehydration. That means you're dehydrated. If your buttocks start tightening up, no, 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 it isn't that you didn't train enough, it's that you're dehydrated. So those are the signs you have to watch for. So if well, I, I, I don't think Craig's gotten the order of beer yet for Highway 4090. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on there. Yes, I know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I found out that it, it would violate their their insurance if, if they if the staff gave me beer. So you know, I, I understand that now. I was very angry at the time. <laughs> All right, thank Tim, you. Tim says that's why there's not that. <laughs> thank you so much. I want to. I want to thank all the crews for coming out here. I uh, went down to San Diego and it was a first time person and her, his wife. And I think crewing, you're not going to like this runners, is harder than running. <laughs> and uh, really being uh, nice to your crew, please. Because <laughs> um, they deserve a lot to come out here. And, um, and everything you're going through, they're doing it in spades. So uh, just be nice to them and pacers. 
I am Plummet, so I'm a little nervous, but um, I like just to set my watch every 30 minutes because I also need reminding because I get a little nervous. So for them and for me, and then I know to ask them certain questions every 30 minutes if they're eating or drinking. So it's a little trick. I know it kind of is a drag to hear it beep every 30 minutes, but um, and you also you can ask your brother if that's okay because sometimes they're like, really, only 30 minutes has gone over. We will leave. Da -da -da -da. But, <laughs> But um, that's a little trick. I don't know. Did you get to see the words? But yeah. Um, then they start like, yelling at you, like, no, it's really been only 25. So, uh. <laughs> anyway, so thanks for all the support people and all the volunteer people who um, have been out here. All right. Thanks, Ann. And uh, a quick note before we move on to, to questions from the audience, one more note on Pacers and Crews. Pacers, spend some time in the next day and a half studying the course, studying the maps the mileages between the aid stations that you're going to be running. You know, you, you get, get to know the course, make sure you know that it's the yellow Montreal ribbons and so on and so forth. So that you can, as Tim said, think for your runners. Likewise, crews study the driving directions in the program. Really study those, figure out so you know where you're going, fill up on gas, all of those little things. Lastly, about crews and pacers, long distance endurance trail running is by and large a solitary act. Yeah, when we roll out a squad, there'll be a few hundred people, and we'll get together in pairs or triples or fives, and occasionally you might latch on to one or two other runners and run through a canyon together, but by and large, you're on your own. And it can be a wonderfully shared experience to enjoy the Western States experience with a crew and with a pacer. Many of you have paid thousands of dollars to be out here this weekend, and the crews, if you add up the amount of time you're going to be able to have meaningful contact with your runner on Saturday, it will not be very much time by the clock. <laughs> but it could be some of the most meaningful minutes that that runner has of that entire race. Whether it gets them that Coke at just the right time, or gets them off the chair, or that idea to maybe change socks right now, whatever it is, that two minutes at Michigan Bluff could really change the experience for that person. Mind you, crews, you're gonna drive a couple of hundred miles, you're gonna sit out in heinous heat, you're not gonna have a lot of food of your own to eat, and your rudder's gonna come through and you're gonna be like a NASCAR pit crew, and then they're gonna be gone. And you're gonna be like the mom after her daughter's wedding. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's, get, work that out now. Because it can really, it can really be an enriching, I mean, my relationship with my family, it's a strong relationship nonetheless, but it's all the more strong because of their crewing me at 2,800 mile races. I can guarantee it. And it's, it can be really, really meaningful in the kind of thing you talk about 5, 10, 20 years from now. At this point, um, I, I'm conscious of the hour, it's about quarter to six. I do want to open it up, we've got a big crowd here. I'd like to open it up to questions from the crowd. What I would like, a, a, a small uh, a caution, I would, I, this is, this is a, a veterans panel with advice about the race. It's not a press conference. We have some, we have all four of these athletes are extremely, extremely well-known, famous ultra runners. And they could, you know, they could answer press questions. This isn't about press questions. If you have some thoughts about some questions, some things you'd like to know about related to the race, that this combined, I believe it's at least 60 finishes at Western States, if, I, if my math is correct, I have to give you, please ask away. I'll try and uh, pick you out. If you could just stand up and, and ask the question, that'd be great. Yes? Oh, Gordy has one thing you'd like to say first. You need a beer? Okay. <laughs> you know, we're, we have a, when we run, we have a, a conflict between wanting to get on down the trail, and on a, especially a you know, day like this that's coming up, or any day, getting sufficient nourishment, whether it be fluid or, or food. And one of, the, one of the things I do that I don't see many people doing, and I just started this you know, last year, is I carry a half gallon Ziploc bag. Sometimes I bum it at the aid station because I forget to put it in my shorts. You know, I got this little pocket there. And, and then I just, I stuff it full of food, and then I walk, you know, eating the watermelon and the boiled potatoes with salt. And, you know, I'm sure you know that if, if you stand there at that aid station for three minutes and somebody else takes walking, 
You know, it takes quite a while to catch him. It takes a lot of effort. In the meantime, he's basically resting, you know. So I would advise all of you, you know, who are crewing, carry a half gallon Ziploc bag in case your runner wants it. And all of you runners, put one of those in your little pocket on your shorts. All right, thank you. Half gallon Ziploc bag, beer. First question's over here. How much water do you need between two checkpoints, the longest one, being so hot? Are you okay with a liter and a half? It's too hot in the front, you might need more. If you are a medium runner, right? Well, I, you know, I, I weigh 200 pounds. What I do is I usually carry a, a 24 ounce bottle that has water in it and a 24 ounce bottle that has mixed, that usually easy? concentrated beyond what they give me at the aid station. And then sometimes I'll carry an additional bottle. So, so, like I'm talking about Red Star Ridge. I'll sometimes head down Red Star Ridge with three bottles. Obviously, I don't have much experience in heat and I've not been to Hong Kong, but here it tends to be like dry heat, so I think that's something that might be quite different from Hong Kong. Um, but what I would say is, yes, if you carry water and you get to an aid station and you've still got water left, you're like, oh, I wasted you know, carrying that weight, but it's much better to do that than to run out of water and then start getting dehydrated and dig yourself into a hole. Um, personally, I use a hydration pack and I have like two liters in that. And certainly this is meant to be a very hot year. I would then have one handheld with water. You might be planning, you can go in a creek and tip that over your head. But if it's still full with, well, unless you want to get charged here, if your foot's full with tap water or bottled water, if you were planning to tip that over your head but you're thirsty, well, now you've got extra water. So I think it's better to carry too much in the fear that you're going to get slowed down by that. You'll get slowed down more if you run out of water and get dehydrated. So it's three bottles, relatively. About, I have about two and a half litres. But equally, when you're leaving the each aid station, you'll see a sign and it gives you the distance to the next aid station. So if you're looking at those and you think, hey, this looks like a longer portion, you can err on the side of caution. If it looks like a short one, then you might take slightly less. Second question, I'm still looking for a pacer. If anybody... <laughs> hey, sir, anybody who needs pace, uh, wants to pace, right here. Uh, come see him at the end. What's your name? Alex. Alex, come see Alex at the end. Question, right here, Marcus. Thanks, uh, Marcus from Australia. Um, do you change shoes and socks, and if so, why? What would prompt you? Shoe changes. Um, I know people that do, but I, first year when I did it, I got to the other side of the river, and my feet swelled so much that it took like 10 minutes to get my shoe feet back in the shoes. So it's just something to consider if you are going to do that lace, really undo the laces. Because your feet, especially in a hot year, can really swell, and if you if it's looking too bad, you don't you know your feet will dry. I mean, people freak out about it, but it's going to be so hot after the river. Um, and same with socks. Then you have different abrasion sites. So I know a lot of people swear by it, but after that first experience, I didn't really want to ever see my feet again. <laughs> Any other shoe shoe comments? Tim? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the only wet crossing is going to be at the river. Yeah. So Duncan Canyon is not going to be a wet stream crossing if you're nimble. There are rocks you can get across there. So there, there shouldn't be a point that your shoes are going to get drenched just from running in the snow or if it's a snow year. So the, the most opportune time if people really do need to change shoes is at the river crossing. But uh, if you're feeling good, just keep going. Don't change. One thing I'll just add though is, uh, like we were talking before, if we were pacers, so now your runner after tonight says, okay, so I don't need spare shoes, still bring spare shoes and socks. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Right here. Hey, I got a comment. <laughs> a shoe comment? Always, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always change a losing game, but never change a winning game. If your shoes are working and, and, yeah. and they're working good enough that you can go on, even if they hurt a little, you know, but if it's not bad. Go on. One more quick note on that. If your feet do turn into mush, there will be podiatrists at some of the aid stations. So if it is going to be impossible to continue without getting your feet worked on, get to an aid station that has a doctor there, they'll take care of you. All right, thank you. Question. 
So I think I read once or saw in a film that Anne Tracen for drop bags to keep things, when it's really hot, to keep them cold, that you use dry eyes. I was wondering how, how do you do that? How, if you need to rely on drop bags, do you keep those things cold on such a hot day? Okay, so I've been away a while. So. <laughs> and back in the day, I think you were able to use those little the playmates. I don't, I've heard that you can't do those anymore. I don't know if that's true. But all my drops were playmates and a uh, little ice box thing. So I'd have two bottles in each of those. So I'd just come and pick them up and either um, uh, freeze the bottles beforehand if it was a hot year. That wasn't really a great idea. But put a lot of ice in there and have ice so it was really quick. So that's how I kept things going, but I don't know if that's allowed, and it's not allowed anymore. So I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> right here, yeah. I'm from the UK, I've never seen a brown bear. How many can I expect to see? On <laughs> <laughs> how many brown it just so happens that I got an uh, email message from a friend of mine that was saw a brown bear at Highway 49 and No Hands Bridge just today, so there's a decent chance. The thing is, don't worry about a bear. The only, the only bear you have to worry about is one who has cubs. So if a bear is acting a little like, if it isn't running away from you, it's looking a little aggressively, start looking around in the trees for cubs because that's probably what's happening. You can, you can retreat from a bear and it, will, it won't follow you. you know, they, they basically want to be left alone. Usually they run away from you. I, I've never had a bear, well I've had bears sit there and look at me because they wanted to get back to you know, tearing the stump apart and getting to the worms. But you know, what you really have to worry about if, if, you're, if you're out there alone with them, wilderness, I mean, you might want to worry about the mountain lion. There, there, is, there, is a rule. there is a rule with mountain lions is don't ever run. You cannot run away from a mountain lion. You cannot. Don't ever run. The only people who get killed are the ones who run. You have to stare them down. Believe me, this is a good thing to do. I've done it. You stare the mountain lion down, eventually it will leave. <laughs> Fear was getting lost, but now I have bigger fears. <laughs> I, um, this is my first run, and I'm worried about getting lost. And I'm wondering if any of you guys, in the early um, times that you've run Western states, whether you got lost. <laughs> getting lost. Do we need to worry about that? No. <laughs> I think it's a very straightforward answer, like, uh, unless you're the lead guys and it's a snow year and then you're really looking out, it's a very basic trail, any turns are very, very well marked and there is, uh, I don't want to say it, but there's really pretty much zero chance that you're even going to be concerned, did I go the wrong way? <laughs> Question over here, we're I know a lot of people who've been lost. <laughs> Wendell used to have a saying for the horse riders, don't worry, nobody's ever been lost more than three days. <laughs> so, I know a lot of people have been lost. One of the, uh, it's mostly during snow years, but not just in snow years. And people get kind of carried away, you know. Uh, I'm trying to think of, Mike Morton got lost for 15 minutes and then set the record. Um, I think Killian got lost. So, uh, we have quite a record of front runners getting lost. <laughs> I got lost once when I was at the back of a pack, running along, talking to somebody, and the guy who was in front went the wrong way, and we all followed him. So, when you're in the back of the pack, when you're following somebody, make sure that they're taking the right turn. Don't just follow them. Yeah, and, and certainly keep an eye out for those yellow ribbons. Uh, they are, it is well marked, all the intersections are well marked, and particularly, uh, there, there are confidence ribbons. If you've gone, a, five minutes without seeing one, you may be off the trail. But just a couple of more questions and then some parting words. Do you have a question, sir? Didn't you overhydrate? How do you know if you're overhydrating or underhydrating? Can you overhydrate? 
Oh yeah, and that's probably one of the most dangerous situations of the race. So uh, there will be scales that, that made in aid stations that you can weigh in. That'll be the first thing that happens when you enter the aid station. You'll get your weight, and then the doctor will probably, usually there's a doctor at the scale or someone watching you weigh in, and then based on what you weighed in tomorrow morning and where you weigh out at the aid station, they'll consult on how you're taking care of yourself. It's much more dangerous to be overweight than it is to be a little underweight. So. If you find yourself five or six pounds overweight, it's time to stop drinking and, and get back to equilibrium. Um, there's a lot of research involved there, but you probably read it all. But yeah, it is possible. And the main thing is just to keep at it, you know, take your salts and get some other things other than just water. And if you find yourself gaining weight, stop drinking. Pay attention to those scales when you weigh in. There's maybe if you're overweight, you aren't running hard enough. <laughs> 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 One more question. Right here. One more question. I'm not sure about the rules, whether a pacer can be in front of a runner, but I'm wondering what's more effective for a runner to have their pacer behind them or in front of them? What do you find makes you a faster runner? Pacer position. And what do you think? Huh. You know, that's kind of interesting because I always wanted the pacer behind me, but now that I've been pacing more or thinking, talking to people about it, and they kind of want, well, the guy in San Diego, he ought to be behind him. Um, the, the two people I'm pacing um, on Saturday, they want me in front of them. So I think it's really up to what the runner feels more comfortable. I think I'd I mean, want you in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is you can change. I mean, I was, I, I listened to my guy till about three miles from the finish, and then I really wanted to break 26, so I just went in and started treating the guy like a dog. <laughs> Come on, we can do it. We can really do it. So yeah, I think it just depends on the runner, and, uh, and you have plenty of time out there to try different positions. <laughs> <laughs> any other, any other, uh... People have different talents at pacing to get the most out of their bodies. And, you know, I, I remember one time I was pacing uh, Catherine Corbett from, uh, on the Rio de Lago the last 16 miles, and I wish I had volunteered to control her forward progress a little earlier. I didn't start until we were about eight miles from the finish. I wish I'd started, because I noticed she was running inefficiently. You know, she was like, she, she'd jog a hill and then get to the flat and walk. Well, you don't want to do that. You want to walk the hill and run the flat. And so about eight miles from the finish, I said, would you mind if I control the pace? And I tell her, okay, you run now, walk now. And we speed it up quite a bit. And if we'd had, you know, if we'd had four more minutes at Negro Bar, she could have made 24 hours. That would have been a big deal. But we didn't, you know, I didn't start soon enough. So the question is, who is the best? And that's the person who should be controlling, controlling the pace, whether it's the pacer or the runner. And it really doesn't matter whether they're behind or in front. It's just. The, the person has to, the person who's the best has to control the pace. Of course, if it's the runner, they don't have to say anything. If it's the pacer, they have to say, you got to walk now, you got to run now, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we close, uh, I would thank you for those questions, by the way. I would like the panelists to take a moment and, uh, and just impart for everybody, and we'll start with Gordy and finish with Anne. One, one, one takeaway, one, one, single pearl of wisdom for this assembled group going into Saturday. I think I exhausted my pearls of wisdom for a moment, so <laughs> I'm going to pass this to Tim, and if I think of anything at the end, I'll add it. <laughs> well, mostly for the first-timers out there, when, when I did mine the first time, and that was 1981, I thought the world was coming to an end at Devil's Thumb. And so, for you guys that are out there for the first time, that's the first time where you're going to think that the math just doesn't add up. You know, you're halfway and you feel like you've used 80% of your energy, so just ignore the math. It doesn't pan out ever in the last 50 miles. Just keep going. This is where I say back to the original comment, I mean, this is where the aid station people make a difference. I remember I sat down at Devil's Thumb, I was kind of a lump of mush, and they gave me those cold towels on the shoulders and a popsicle and told me I was looking good and I knew they were lying. <laughs> But you know, they just give you that energy that says, okay, now you just gotta go over to Michigan Bluff, it's not that far. 
And uh, that was before they had an aid station at the bridge, so it was a long haul. But you know, you just go aid station to aid station then. But you know, and Devil's Thumb's going to be a hard pull, and that's where it's going to be the hottest part. You're thinking, man, this just isn't going to pan out. But just keep moving, and you'll be fine. Um, I think what Anne sort of already mentioned is don't panic when things go wrong. Um, number of races I sometimes hear, and they say, oh, my race went totally wrong because I left an aid station and I. I left two gels behind. And I said, well, it didn't go wrong because you left two gels behind. It went wrong because you panicked because you'd left those two gels behind. Yes, you planned to have them. Um, you've pro some of you might have like really, really well laid out plans. You might have splits where you want to be then, where I'm going to change shoes or pick up this. Um, I know one uh, very laid back uh, Calgary runner. And uh, when she came in to pick up her pacer at Forest Hill, she wasn't there and she went, Oh well, I'll carry on running. So, and she knew her pacer was going to get to the next point when she could, and indeed they got to the next point, and oh, there she was, sorry I drove the wrong way. So uh, she had the real calm of mind to just go, do you know what, she's not here, there's nothing I can do about it. So, so roll with the things that go wrong, don't panic, don't stress over them. Think of, okay, what can I do as a solution, right? You know, whereas there's an next aid station, it might not be the gel flavor I like, but, you know, it'll keep me going till I get to my crew, um, and yeah, and then you'll be back on track. Um, yeah, I think uh, because of the heat, I always like the hot days because it challenged you the most, and it made you really think. And the more you're thinking, the faster the race goes. Um, so I would say just keep trying to uh, uh, look at it not just as an athletic event, but also as a chess game or whatever. I like to play games. So um, I kind of always looked at the hot years as a, a, a play on, on what I could keep together mentally and just keep problem solving because there might be people who won't have problems on Saturday. Great. But I always had problems in the hot years, the more problems. So I just tried to keep thinking and, and uh, kind of can work through almost anything. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Morning, morning, hot one. This is, I'm kind of repeating what has been said, especially what Ellie said. And that is, uh, you know, there's, there's a saying that the, the, the night is darkest just before dawn. And there's a lesson in life and a lesson in running here for all of us. And that is that most of the people who quit, they quit just before it gets better. I've seen that so many times. So, you know, if, if you feel like you're finished, my advice is pull out that half gallon Ziploc bag. <laughs> Make sure it's a Ziploc bag. And fill it up with watermelon and potatoes with a lot of salt and walk to the next aid station. Yeah. Because, you know, they always used to say here in the old days, back in the day, there's always another day. But let's face it, there isn't always another day. This is your day. Thanks, Gordy. <laughs> All of you who are here, uh, you've, you've arrived in Squaw Valley in the best shape of your life. And uh, as my old friend Andy Black used to say, you'll arrive in Auburn in the worst shape of your life. <laughs> but you've worked hard. Uh, you've trained, you've sacrificed family, jobs, perhaps both. And uh, you've trashed your feet. You've yeah. sat in saunas, you've gone running in 90 degree weather, in weather with sweatshirts on. If you, if, for those of you in here who know me, um, you, you probably know I'm, I'm crazy in love with this race. I said to a uh, person earlier today, I said, I am like a teenage girl who has a crush on the varsity quarterback when it comes to Western States. I'm gonna smile all the way to the finish line if I can on Saturday and probably into Sunday. But of all the, I think going into Saturday, I'd like to just leave you with this. Of all of the great attributes and characteristics that drive us as endurance runners, discipline, focus, 
uh, aggressiveness, um, paying attention to the details, having an engineer's mind for the details, but the artist's mind for a big picture. For me, particularly as a 100 mile runner who doesn't do very well in anything shorter than 100 miles, the most important characteristic that ultra running has given me, and I, I can assure you as, as you've heard in these comments, and will come in handy on Saturday and into Sunday, is patience. Patience. I don't want to get on a soapbox here, but you know this world we live in these days, very impatient world. It's what's the cool new thing? What are we doing tomorrow? What text just came in? What am I missing on my Facebook feed while I'm here listening to these people talk? <laughs> but when we go out there tomorrow or Saturday and have 18 to 30 hours to get across from Squaw Valley to Auburn, patience is going to really matter when we panic because our pacer doesn't show up. Or there's not enough ice in Cal 3. Or they're taking boats instead of walking across the river, God forbid. <laughs> uh, if you have that patience, and we've learned patience, right? We've maybe been injured, and we've had to be patient to get over those injuries. We've had bad races where we had to recover from and then build up again and be patient in our training and believe that our patience and just sticking with it, just showing up day after day would be enough. If you can go into Saturday, and as Gordy said, take your time up that hill. Be sure to turn around and look back at the lake before you dive into Granite Chief Wilderness. Talk to the aid station people. Spend some time with your crews. Patiently experience this. For many of you, we, hey, let's face it, this, is, this has become a race that has taken on a life of its own. For many in this room, it's your one time here. Savor it. Enjoy it, and most of all, patiently find your way from Squaw Valley to Auburn. On behalf of everybody with the Western States race, and particularly Gordy, Tim, Ellie, and Ann, thank you so much. Have a great race.